this week a special edition of the KPBS Roundtable. We shine a light on the unique storytellers you'll find on KPBS Podcasts. I'm Alan Lilienthal, and you're listening to Only Here. This is Rad Scientist. Welcome back to another episode of listener-supported KPBS Cinema Junkie podcast. San Diego's culture, science, and film. It's a discussion with our hosts about their passions and platforms. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. I'm Mark Sauer, and this week we're doing something a bit different on the KPBS Roundtable, a special look at the shows and hosts that make up a small part of the growing KPBS podcast platform. And joining me today are Kinsey Moreland, KPBS podcast producer and editor, Margo Wall, host of Rad Scientist, Alan Lilienthal, host of Only Here, and Beth Accomando, KPBS arts reporter and host of the Cinema Junkie podcast. Well, it's tough for podcast, uh, broadcast audiences, that is, especially radio listeners who observe statistics. So let me throw a few at you anyway. There are more than 750,000 podcasts available in the United States. 90 million Americans listen to at least one podcast in the past month. Half of listeners do so at home, 22% in their car. And the U.S. is fifth among countries when comparing the percentage of residents listening to podcasts. Number one, South Korea at 58%. All right, that is a mouthful <laughs> of statistics, and let's get past that. And it's safe to say, though, podcasts are more popular uh, than ever, right? That's right. I've been to a couple podcast conferences in the last year, and this is what all the charts look like, just going, going up. up. Yeah. Now, give us a bit of history. Uh, the word podcast, where did that originate? A bit quaint now, isn't it? It is, because it's for old, older people like me who've been listening <laughs> for a long time. We had our little iPods and we would go to our computer and download the file onto our little iPod and then go. And so it's after iPod and then, of course, the cast comes from broadcast. So. Okay. Now, uh, for those not familiar, uh, how does a podcast differ from a traditional talk show? Well, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it is a traditional talk show, but it doesn't have the same constraints of time and uh, format that traditional broadcast does. So. They can be anything. They can be narrative. They can be experimental. They can be fiction, audio dramas. It's really, it's really the sky's the limit. Or traditional interviews and right, and, right, and, and clips and exactly. all. Exactly. So give us an overview how KPBS curates, produces podcasts, and you're our first podcast editor. So <laughs> it's bigger than ever here right now. It is. We're so excited. We have eleven podcasts, and we do actually roundtable as a podcast. So there's some that are broadcast to podcast. So you can find all your shows that you listen to on KPBS in the podcast space. And then we have like one investigative series and then we have special podcasts that we actually put a call out to the community and they give us ideas and we look through them and then we end up producing some of those podcasts. And what sort of feedback do you get from KPBS listeners? Oh my gosh, the best. Because we just got an, we get, the cool thing about podcasts is that people are listening everywhere. So just yesterday we got some feedback from someone in Wisconsin who said, she just related to every single episode of Only Here that we did. So it's really cool to see how connected they feel to the, the stories. And they're stuck inside with that cold blast of weather there, so they have all the time to <laughs> yeah, listen to podcasts. We have heard that it makes them feel warm when they listen to our podcast. <laughs> From so San Diego. Like, yep. And the elements of a really good, uh, popular podcast. You know what? I keep coming back to just a good story. Narrative podcasts that just have a really good story. I mean, storytelling is an oral tradition, right? And so with podcasts, again, you don't have those constraints. So just a good story with a beginning, middle, and end that you can really connect with the character who's telling the story, the host who's helping tell it. And trends, as you said at the outset, uh, trends are, are anything, anything you want them to be, right? They are. Well, I think kids' podcasts are a cool trend that are happening. A lot of people are making podcasts specifically for young audiences. Uh, smart speakers are kind of changing the listening experience. So whereas we used to listen only in our cars or with our earbuds in, now people, it's more of a communal experience because you're telling your Amazon speaker to play this podcast or that podcast, so, so you're listening with your family. Okay. All right, let's toss over to Alan now. Tell us about uh, Only Here. How'd your podcast come about, the idea behind it? Yeah, well, actually, it started, the origin story, Kinsey can probably speak to you better because it started before I came here, but um, I was doing a lot of cross-border work. Obviously, we have a huge border, one of the most, the most crossed in the Western Hemisphere, and there's a lot of mystery. I mean, not mystery, but people, it's abstract for most people. People don't experience it on a, on a daily basis, and it's a huge part of my life. I cross the border every day, and for a lot of people here, it's a huge part of their lives, and we wanted to tell stories that 
kind of paint that picture a little more clearly and demystify what border life is really like through stories of creativity and subcultures that don't often get spoken about when speaking about the border. All right, well, that's a nice segue. Let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about it, get a little taste of, of uh, the podcast here and set this one up for us. Sure, this one is one of the latest episodes we did. It's about low riding. Low riding is actually a Mexican-American tradition. It's not from Mexico. It's from, by Mexicans who live in America, Chicano culture. Um, but here in a border town, it's taking on some very interesting forms because you have both Mexico and America and we kind of explore low riding through the eyes of someone who's been deported who came from America to Mexico and can't come back and brought low riding with him as a way to kind of maintain connection to his, to his culture. All right, let's hear that. These days, the slow and low to the ground cars and bikes can be found almost anywhere. Low riding has become a culture created by Chicanos and exported all over the world. It's big in Japan. No, seriously not to mention in Brazil and other lowrider hotspots. But at the border, the lowrider scene is a lifeline. Back on Logan Avenue, Eduardo Magana is showing off his gorgeous, multicolored 1965 Chevy Impala. Wow, that's tight. <laughs> it's cool like this. It's... Wow. It is a big backyard party where everybody is behaving, um, having a good time. Uh, we all sit here in a corner, we'll talk to, amongst each other, and then we'll uh, go and talk to everybody else in different clubs. And we're all just just talking, having a good time. All right, uh, who would you say your, your audience is and what kind of feedback are you getting from them? Yeah, I mean, we cast a pretty wide net. Um, we're mostly interested in people who who maybe have heard of the border or maybe have never crossed and, and are interested in, in, in traveling and adventure and, and learning about new cultures, and, but also people here who, who do interact with the border but maybe don't necessarily fully understand the, the richness and the, the dynamic, the, the dynamism, I don't know if that's a word, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> the robust nature. The robust nature of border life and, and the, the kind of what emerges from that. Um, obviously, we, we hear a lot about the drama, uh, but you don't hear a lot about what the, what emerges from the drama, the creativity and the and the and the yeah and the culture. So yeah, we want people who are interested in in exploring new cultures and who are interested in the arts and food and yeah. And what makes a good well. episode? What's your best ideas? That's something we're exploring ourselves. I, I think <laughs> I think like Kinsey said, just a good character, more than more so than an idea or a theme, the a person that represents whatever kind of culture we want to explore that comes out of the border. I think a, 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 an intriguing personal story of someone who's, who, in, who crosses the border and has been shaped by the border and whose work and life have been shaped by the border. And uh, you've already seen Only Here evolve a little bit. It's kind of changing as you go along, right? Yeah, it's been changing even recently more. We recently we were, we were part of a PRX's Project Catapult in Boston, which is kind of a six-month podcast incubator sort of thing. And through that, we're just learning a lot about how to tell better stories more than anything. I think the stories, there's way too many to tell. So we don't have any lack of that. It's more of how can we present these stories in a way that's universal and very local. Um, because like Kinsey said, there's someone from like Wyoming, Wisconsin, that mm -hmm. really felt these stories. And that's, that's beautiful that we can f find these stories that are so local to us, but also have these universal themes running through them. Um, so yeah, I think the evolution is just figuring out how to tell these stories in a more impactful way. And Kenzie, how often do we uh, produce these stories? Is it a regular schedule or is it, geez, how long it takes and how, how we get a good story and how long it takes to get to get it together? Oh my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> deadlines in, in the deadline, journalism uh, business? Every other week, so we come out on Wednesdays every other week, so. Okay. And, um, uh, of course, we can get, as you mentioned at the outset, we can get the podcast, all these podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, on kpbs.org, and it's so easy these days, you can even tell a machine and play this and off we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to shift now to uh, Margot and Rad Scientist, and the name itself is intriguing, but <laughs> explain the concept behind, uh, behind your podcast. Sure. Well, Rad, you know, um, I'm from the East Coast, so coming to California, you know, Rad is <laughs> the word you guys like to use a lot. I feel like it's having a comeback too, I don't know. 
Um, but anyways, the, the concept of the show is um, to profile a scientist from San Diego. And it's kind of like a character study. Like, who are these people who dedicate their lives to this really tiny subject matter to kind of glean a little bit of knowledge that's new um, and also to kind of be part of the bigger scope of figuring out like what we live on and how we live, how we cure diseases, all sorts of different things. And uh, San Diego is a pretty good hotbed for that, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we've got all sorts of scientific research here and scientists here. So many, yeah. There's just like this huge concentration. I mean, I work at the Salk Institute, but I'm a student at UCSD. There's Scripps right across the street. Um, we have all of the biotech companies in the world. I mean, like there's just so many um, institutions here dedicated to science. It's really awesome. All right, we're going to ha hear a little bit about, or a little bit from, I should say, the uh, the podcast right now. Set up the, this, what we're going to hear now. Sure. So this is the latest episode. Um, this is a, a chemistry student, actually, she just graduated, called Sophia Hirakis. She's a first generation Greek American. And um, she, you know, is thinking broader than her scope of just her research. So she really wants to kind of impact the world through science. And so you'll hear a little bit about her next steps. All right, good. Let's hear that. <laughs> Sophia just defended her PhD, and she's doing some work in a new lab on heart cells. But she's also starting a nonprofit called Works of Wisdom. And the mission is to help young scientists whose circumstances have left them in a new country without many prospects. There are people that have been displaced because of war. Brilliant scientific minds that will never allow be allowed the opportunity to plant themselves like a seed to grow into a fruitful tree. It's heartbreaking when you think about the scientific potential and the potential of these young, brilliant minds who have seen disease, war, and famine and want to change the world for the better. One of the main destinations for recent refugees is Greece. So we have camps of refugees. And within these camps of refugees, you can imagine there are many university students who don't have a place to go. Sophia wants to help refugees gain entrance to countries like the US to continue their scientific education and get them out of the camps. It's aimed at the creation of pipelines for refugees, placing them in internships, giving them preparation for GRE and TOEFL exams, as well as immigration resources. All right, tell us uh, who you're uh, aiming rad scientists at. Who's the audience? Um, so I'd like to say everyone, because science <laughs> is affecting you, whether you want More to More the merrier. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but not only do you have to be like interested in science, um, I also, if you're just interested in human beings in general, I mean, the show is really about exploring one person in depth, what makes them tick, what makes them unique, um, their weird quirks, and then also why they think what they're studying for years and years on end is the most fascinating thing in the world. <laughs> and can I just add that Please, the clip see. we played was really serious, but Margo is <laughs> hilarious. She's a pun master. And Thank you. so a lot of the episodes After are my just, own heart. Yeah, exactly. A lot of them are just fun to listen to. And at the end, she does this little audience engagement piece. So I think her, her shows are fun and interactive in a lot of cases. Now, uh, Margaret, you're a neuroscience PhD student. How's the process of creating this podcast uh, shaped your wider experience in your education? It's been quite an interesting journey. And it actually really has affected the way that I communicate my science. So obviously, um, in doing this show, I have to be able to take other people's science um, make sure that I understand it first and then be able to explain it in a way that anyone can understand it. And so I've realized, actually recently I gave a talk and someone was like, it was like you were giving a podcast talk. <laughs> and so now when I give my academic talks, I think I'm almost um, doing it in podcast format, apparently. <laughs> well, science, <clears throat> excuse me, early in my career as a journalist back at the university, actually, I uh, had a, a similar thing, not a podcast, but writing a lot about scientific research. And it's, it's difficult because I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, a doctor or certainly a specialist in a certain area. How do you make it uh, open to a, a general audience and yet satisfy the scientists that we're not dumbing it down or simplifying it too much? Um, well, the thing you'll learn when you become a scientist is that you know nothing. And so um, I barely know anything about what I research is how I feel. And <laughs> even I in know, a PhD program. Yes, and I know <clears throat> even less about what these other scientists are doing. So oftentimes I'm on the same you know, playing field as everyone else. So I need to get it to where I can understand it. 
Um, and that should leave it, hopefully, where other people can understand it. I mean, something, some concept like uh, the universe uh, being curved or flat, like something like that is like, okay, <laughs> I need to take a step back. This is hard to understand. Um, and so I have to get it to a point where I'm like, okay, now I can finally transmit this idea to other people. I can't even get my mind around, around what an algorithm is. So I, <laughs> well, we hear that all the time, of course. I'll, I'll tell you later. Yeah. Well, uh, I wanted to get into this, and any of us who've interviewed scientists over the years, even if you're not on a science beat, there's got to be a trick to getting scientists to shed that whole stay just the facts ma'am persona and get into the spirit of the podcast and relating to a general audience. How do you, how do you get them to do that? Get them to loosen up. Um, I think, I, I mean, I come in and um, I can be like a little goofy, so I kind of try to get people into like the goofy mindset, especially towards the end, I'll do like a little bit at the end that's kind of like just goofy. Someone, um, it could be like them rapping or writing a haiku, and at first you can see like they're a little uncomfortable, but at some point if you just <laughs> prod them enough and then also like, all right, let me help out, like boom, boom, ba -choo, you know, like, you know, <laughs> getting into it yourself, maybe, um, I'm not exactly sure how, but I just think that by being myself, which is like a little goofy, I can sometimes pull it out of, of people as well. You know, it's kind of a serious thing. We do a lot of stories. I, I do a lot of interviews on KPBS about climate change and this, this profound uh, challenge that's facing all of us now. But uh, scientists were criticized early on for being, you know, too straight, just the facts, here's the report on this, and not, you know, talking about the urgency of it and, and having, you know, engaging the audience, as it were. I mean, that's an example, I think, of where it's really important to get scientists to open up. Yeah, storytelling matters, um, even for science. I know that uh, some people don't like to, to acknowledge that, but narrative is how we connect with everything. And so having storytelling as a part of the way that we communicate important science like climate change um, is going to make other people um, understand, I think, the gravity of it. All right, Beth, we want to move on to something that maybe doesn't have so much uh, gravity. And you seem to be <laughs> one of the pioneering podcasters uh, here. It seems like a Cinema Junkie's been around even before podcasts were even. Well, not that long. Uh, <laughs> KPBS kind of recognized that podcasts were something that had a lot of potential when Serial did so well and won awards and just had millions of listeners. And so that's when they really wanted to launch it. And that was, so I launched the podcast in 2015 because I love movies and I've been covering film for KPBS and NPR since the 90s. And I had this wealth of interviews where I used like maybe a minute for a radio feature. Uh, but I had interviews with, you know, John Woo, Wong Kar Wai, John Carpenter, all these people. And I said, well, here's the thing. We can do podcasts on stuff that's new and then also dig into the archives so that I'm not constantly having to put out a new podcast every week and save time and energy, but be able to, like, cover film in an interesting way. So you didn't interview D.W. Griffith and, and, and yeah, Capra. Not old. Not that, yep. that, not that far back. Yep. <laughs> now, this name seems self-explanatory, but, it, but it's more than just movies. I mean, you really branch out beyond cinema, don't you? Yeah, I mean, to me, <laughs> pop culture and movies are a gateway to talking about anything. And people have easy access to films. They're not scared of them in terms of, you know, going to see a film about a topic and feeling like they don't know anything. Um, so I think films are an easy way for people to learn about other perspectives, other worlds, other cultures, ideas that they're not familiar with. And through the podcast, I hope that I can open their eyes to a wealth of different topics, a wealth of different perspectives, and also understand the creative process and what goes into making a film better. Right, all that behind the scenes stuff that, yep. that really is fascinating to all of us. Well, we want to get a little uh, taste of cinema junkie here in a recent clip. Set this one up for us. Sure. So, The Lighthouse is a new film, still in theaters. Robert Eggers is the director. And he is a filmmaker where you really feel the craft of his film. So, I appreciated the opportunity to have him on the show to really talk in depth about what went into making this film. All right, good. Let's hear that. And one element that's great in this also is the soundscape, because there isn't a real defining line between kind of ambient sound or sound, real sounds and then music and then sound design. And talk a little bit about how you work with sound on your film. When I was shooting the film on Cape Forshu, which is a peninsula off the southern tip of Nova Scotia, the sounds and the power of the sea and the wind was so uh, present that, you know, I, I wanted to have a really large sounding movie. That was the only way to do it. So we worked very hard with 
Damien Volpe, the sound designer, and Mark Corvin, the composer, on, on as you say, uh, blending the, the lines between these two things, where the foghorn would sort of meld with the aleatoric brass section and Willem Dafoe's flatulence. And there was a lot of work to be done to make sure that every object in the house sounded as crusty, dusty, rusty, musty. I hope I didn't already use that string of words in, in, in this interview. But, you know, to make everything sound as broken down as as possible so that when, you know, when you hear all, all the rust and old pipes and horrible sounds of the water pump that you know that the water that's going to come out of that has got to be the worst tasting water that's ever existed. All right, all the rich sounds that we were talking about there. Well, Beth, to quote an old Bob Seger lyric, um, you know, how do you know what to leave in and what to leave out? So many movies, so limited, pot, even podcasts, you can't do them forever. No, uh, I mean, what I do is I tend to follow my passions. I feel that if I'm really interested in a filmmaker or a film or a genre, that the enthusiasm I have and in talking to the people, the people I have on the show understand that I'm genuine in terms of wanting to know about their films or about what their subject matter is. And that that enthusiasm, I think, is what helps get people interested in what I'm talking about. So if they're jazz and you're jazz, the audience should I be think too. So I mean, yeah. I, you know, that's one of the ways you share things that you love is, you know, I mean, I have my love of movies because my dad passed it on to me. And, you know, if he hadn't had that, I'm not sure I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. I want to ask you a, 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 just a, a basic question I've always had about about being a, a film critic here mm -hmm. and how you judge when a movie is is done really well. It may not be the most popular movie. There's a, we always hear, oh, the critics love this one, the audience uh, didn't turn out and all. But what are you looking for just in what they're trying to do and how well do they do it? Yeah, I mean, you know, reviewing films and being a critic, it's like eating a good meal too. Like you can't tell me that if I say I love broccoli that I'm wrong. So, you know, when you review a film, it's like, it's how it speaks to you. And I can watch a film and sometimes say like, that was a well-made film, but it's not my cup of tea. But for me, I'm looking for what is the film trying to do? Does it achieve it? And then was it worth doing in the first place? So to me, that's kind of the elements that I look for. And a lot of times, you know, the film is going to hook you in that opening couple of minutes. And you know, right, like with The Lighthouse, like when that film opens, you're transported to another world like that. And it was brilliant. And so, you know, but it's an emotional thing, I think, too. And it has an intellectual element to it that you can go back and look at it and evaluate it. But for me, it's just going in. And every time I go into a movie, I just want my jaw to drop down and to be looking up at the screen in awe. Yeah, there you go. Al, I want to get back to you about, uh, about not only here, uh, episode recently, the appeal, uh, the appeal of uh, Tijuana as a uh, movie location. Mm. Uh, movie traffic comes to mind. We're going to hear a, a clip about that. Explain what we're about to hear. Yeah, well, uh, you have a, a city that's kind of built to be a movie set. It's, it's unbelievable. Like there's, you know, carcasses of buildings and all kinds of multicultural looking places and futuristic looking places. And having LA so close, um, there's a lot of potential for it to be a filmmaking capital. Cause there's a, not only as a location, there's a lot of talent, a lot of filmmaking talent in that city that could be tapped into. All right, let's hear about uh, shooting in, in Tijuana. For those who've never been to Tijuana, I should probably take a minute to try to describe it. It's a mishmash of everything. You've got shacks and shanty towns in some parts and million dollar mansions in others. You've got the beach, the desert, and sparkling new skyscrapers next to shells of skyscrapers that were only ever half built. Overall, the city looks somehow both post-apocalyptic, but also futuristic at the same time. In many ways, it's still in the past, with chickens running around on dirt roads that cut across hillsides with apron-wearing abuelas. But the border city also gives us a glimpse of the future with its digital billboards, genre-defying architecture, and collision of world cultures. It's sort of like a ready-made set. If you get out of the touristy areas, which is the parts that I'm more interested in, like the suburbs, everything's ready-made. You can put your camera anywhere you want, you know, without a script and just like start shooting and something will happen. 
Beth, few seconds left. Uh, how about San Diego as a uh, site as well as, as Tijuana for shooting movies? Oh, it's a great location as well. And you know, I've showcased filmmakers from TJ and from San Diego. And you know, we don't have a film commission right now. We're trying to get that started back up and make it easier to shoot here. But it's a great location. Yeah, and for TV shows as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of shootings yes. have been done. Uh, a few seconds left. Going to get that film commission soon. I don't know. Uh, I'm not the one who's able to You're on it, aren't you? whip it up and uh, make it happen. But we'd like to see something like that again to make shooting easier. All right. Well, I, this was a great discussion. I learned a lot myself. It does wrap up another week at the KPBS Roundtable. And thank you to the KPBS podcast producers, Kinsley Moreland and Margo Wall. Alan Lilienthal and Beth Accomando. I want to thank all of you for joining me today and telling me about all of them, our audience, about all of these podcasts. It's terrific. A reminder, all of these KPBS podcasts can be found on all of the major podcast platforms, and it's always on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.